building a better Bay Area for a safe and secure future. This is ABC 7 News. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Kreutz. Welcome to our daily program called Getting Answers. We are asking experts your questions every day at 3 to get answers for you in real time. And coming up, we will talk about the state of the Bay Area housing market and what we can expect in the coming months and years. But first, we have a, a sort of a special show today. One of our guests received a shout out from Governor Gavin Newsom earlier this week. He was elected as mayor at the age of 26. And he is at the center of a new HBO documentary film called Stockton On My Mind. It is now streaming on HBO Max. Joining us to talk about it is Mayor Michael Tubbs. He's also the first African-American mayor of Stockton. And my friend and one of the filmmakers of the documentary, Cassius Michael Kim. Thank you both for joining us. And I want to say that I stood up late last night watching the documentary. It is so beautiful. So congratulations. Thank you so much for having us. Cassius and Mark did a great job. They really Thank you did. very much. Yeah. All right. So, Mayor Tubbs, you know, you have made quite the name for yourself. You're not even 30 yet uh, from being such a young mayor to the Mayors for Guaranteed Income program, similar to a universal basic income program. But you said it yourself in the film, Stockton often gets a bad rap. So what do you hope people learn about you from this film and about your city? Well, more, most importantly, I hope the people learn, that this nation learns that cities like Stockton matter that the folks in my community, the young people, the formerly incarcerated people, the teachers, the essential workers, are really the lifeblood and heart of our democracy. And a lot of the solutions for where we want to go starts with listening and doing work that helps benefit them and their dreams and aspirations, particularly um, our young people. And about me, I hope people learn that there's that in every community, there's a kid right now who may have a father who's incarcerated, mm -hmm. who may have a mother who had them young, who may be going to a high poverty school, who's just as talented, just as intelligent as kids anywhere else in the city, and with the right mentorship, the right resources, and the right opportunity, that they could have the chance to be a mayor or a doctor or a police officer. And I think that that's just important, that my story is not singular, that there's literally millions of folks from backgrounds like mine in this country who just need a fair shot and a fighting chance. Right. If you can do it, other young people can do it, too. And Cassius, you were embedded in Stockton for more than a year working on this film. Tell us a little bit about why you decided to make the film with Mark and what this filmmaking process was like. Well, uh, the project came up right when uh, I planned on moving back to California anyways, after spending 20 years in New York, where you and I met. Uh, and then when I was approached by Mark shortly before I left New York, it just seemed like such a great opportunity to collaborate with such a respected documentarian. And also, I just started hearing about Mayor Tubbs and was very curious about what he was doing in Stockton. And already you could sense that kind of the narrative was changing, right, about Stockton. Growing up in Turlock, uh, Stockton didn't have like that same shine you're seeing now. And so I was very interested in kind of being part of the process and helping tell that story. Yeah, Mayor, one of the most powerful moments in the film is during an interview with your father, who is currently incarcerated for an armed robbery, and he explains that he did that to get money to pay for your baby sister's funeral. It's really a powerful moment to watch as a viewer, and so I'm curious, uh, what was your reaction when you watched that for the first time? Well, it was jarring, because I had no idea. I had never heard, me and my father don't talk that frequently. Um, so I never had a chance to really figure out why, what he was incarcerated for. I just remember growing up, hearing 25 to life, and that meeting, I said, oh, man, he must have killed somebody. And actually being mm -hmm. very scared to find that out in terms of what does that say about me, and very embarrassed. So to like, be as a 29-year-old now, as a father, um, to watch and, and hear that story was moving. And it made me so happy that I did grow up from my teenage anger and, and, and forgave him because I had no idea if indeed what he said, shared with us is true. That those are the cause that, that that's why he committed the crime and i would also say it makes policies like basic income that much more important i can only hope but wonder if he had we had a guaranteed income or a basic income no guarantee but maybe he would have more options to not commit um a, a crime to to pay for burying his daughter Right, and Cassius, you were in the room during that interview and it's so clear how proud the mayor's dad is of him Absolutely. Um, the pride shines through his demeanor, uh, not just in this part you see in the film, but while we're in the room, I think he is so excited to talk about the mayor and the book he had written to share with his son to kind of tell him his life story and who he is as a person. And, you know, throughout the interview, the themes that rise up and uh, again are just how he feels his son took the, qual the positive qualities that he did have just kind of made the most of it, uh, whereas he kind of 
went the wrong way or chose the wrong path uh, to end up where he is now. But I think he looks forward to uh, redeeming himself if possible. And then if he is allowed to uh, leave prison at some point, he just wants to kind of have the opportunity to do better and start over. Uh, and I think, you know, his son would be a big part of that, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh and, and Mayor, you are a new dad, which is part of this too. Um, but you know, a large part of this film is about the cyclical nature of poverty. And something you have done in Stockton to try and combat that is start the Mayors for Guaranteed Income program, giving low-income residents 500 months, no strings attached. Sort of a controversial program when it started. I saw you just extended it. What is the evidence so far that this is working? If you go to StockTheDemonstration.org, which I encourage all the viewers to do, you'll find the spending data, how the money's being spent. And you'll find, much like it's explored in the film, people are spending the money in the ways that you and I spend money. So the majority of money, particularly during COVID-19, is spent on food, then utilities, then merchandise, clothes for children, et cetera. And behind the data, just the stories you hear of folks like Maggie, who was in the film, but also folks who like who are buying dentures because they couldn't afford dentures at, because they're living paycheck to paycheck, people who are paying off debt, people who are able to pay for more tutoring for their kids, people who are able to actually stay home in quarantine because they can afford to take time off work if they're sick with symptoms, and people who are waiting for unemployment still, and the $500 a month has been a lifeline during this time as they wait for the unemployment benefits they qualify for. Because as we know in California, 40% of all people today who paid in and qualify for unemployment insurance still have yet to see a check. So I think it, it, it's been successful and showing the importance of building economic resilience and just providing an income floor that it doesn't replace work. It hasn't made Stockton a different country with a different governing system. We haven't turned communist, but actually have become a more caring and compassionate community. Well, I think, and also I'm gonna ask you just to sort of riff on this, but also if you could repeat that website because I think it cut out. Um, but Mayor, I think it's interesting too, as we start seeing these stimulus checks getting sent out, people start saying, huh, this sort of seems like universal basic income. Absolutely. And I think the stimulus checks are one step, but part of the Mayor's for Guaranteed Income Network, which includes about 20 mayors now, including Mayor Garcetti, a dear friend, Mayor Brown and Compton, a good friend, and Mayor Garcia and Long Beach, a good friend. And essentially, we're saying the checks need to be regular and monthly because we know that bills are regular and monthly. And bills aren't going to stop this month or next month. They'll continue through COVID-19. And if folks aren't able to work or small businesses are being hurt, we have to make sure folks are able to still pay for rent, mortgage, necessities, food, et cetera. Um, and the website for the Stockton Project is StocktonDemonstration.org. And there you can see all the data every month, how money is spent. You can listen to the stories of people and spoiler alert, they're the same things you would say, your family would say, because these are like real people. I'm mm -hmm. um, just like all of us who are making, using money in real time to, to address real needs. And gosh, this film just strikes me as being so timely for this moment. I know you've been working on it prior to the events of the past few months, but right now as we're talking about Black Lives Matter and how to break out of these systemic inequities, uh, I think something I know you told me that stuck with you is just how, also how cyclical so much of this is in these communities. Um, I think as a filmmaker, you can only hope that the topics you're covering uh, become so timely as this film has. And part of that was while we're even making the film, I think myself and Mark, we were both very much struck by the patterns we saw repeating. Um, I've posted on social media about this, but at the heart of the story is the story of Mayor Michael Tubbs and his father. And that extends beyond just them and into the effects of absent fathers in the community uh, as a result of decades of policy and you know activity. But when you see the progress being made, it's not so easy to grasp in the moment, but then to see someone like Isaiah, who was facing similar charges to Mayor Tubbs' father, mm -hmm. but then have someone like Jasmine Delafoss on his side, a community activist who's fighting for his rights and fighting for solutions that aren't punitive, uh, but rather you know rehabilitation-based. And then he's able to find another opportunity where he can plead out and maybe not be condemned to facing several years in prison uh, and then have the opportunity to continue his education and receive money from Stockton scholars and make something of himself because he's a kid who grew up without opportunities. Uh, and we see that all over, not just Stockton, but in this country. So I'm hopeful that the policies Mayor Tufts is pushing uh, kind of fosters a more of compassion-based policy 
because I think that's what we kind of need now for the children in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so timely. And I think we have to wrap up. But before I do, Mayor Tebbs, I just want to give a shout out to your wife because I feel like she was kind of the secret star of this film. Yeah, everyone's been saying <laughs> that, that she was their favorite person. So shout out to my wife, Anna, <laughs> and TSRA Tug. Yeah, who you, you guys met your sophomore year at Stanford here in the Bay Area. So. Yeah, well, I, I, I was a senior. She oh, was a sophomore. She was a sophomore. Okay, got it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I really did enjoy uh, enjoy the parts with her, and congratulations on your new family. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for joining us today, and, and congrats on this documentary, um, Mayor Michael Tubbs from Stockton and filmmaker Cassius Michael Kim. Thank you both so much. Thank you for Thank having you. us. All right, up next, a close look, close look at the Bay Area housing market for renters, buyers, and sellers. Uh, we're going to take a break, though, on air, but the conversation, of course, continues on our live streams, including uh, Facebook Live right now. So stick with us. All right, as soon as you get tongue-tied all of a sudden. All right, thanks for joining us uh, on Facebook. Let me see what you guys are all saying. Um, uh, a little bit of a different show today because I know this was an expert. This is um, our uh, you know, Stockton Mayor Michael Tubbs and a friend of mine, Cassius, who is the filmmaker on this. And he embedded uh, for about a year and a half in Stockton, um, really just following the mayor where he went to try and showcase what this universal basic income program has been doing and what the mayor at the age of 20, he became mayor at the age of 26, he's now 29, he's not even 30 yet, uh, has been able to do uh, in his uh, first term as mayor. And so it's really a fascinating documentary. I did watch it last night um, to be able to talk about it here today. And I, I really recommend you all watch it if you can. It's on HBO. Um, and I think, is our next guest here? All right, hold on one second. Let me just get pull something up. Hold on. Aaron, do you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, thank you so much. Hi, of course. All right, I think how, how much time you guys? Oh, yeah, I see. Okay, one minute. Okay, perfect. Thanks for joining us. You bet. Oh, great. Tina, shout Is this out. Is Yeah. Is that Aaron? Oh, good. Hi. Yeah. Yes. It's sort of funny because I'm, I'm also live right now on Facebook, and so I kind of chat with people on Facebook at the same time. So. Oh. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> um, in fact, you're you're probably there as well. So, but I think Tina, you said love this documentary. Watch this. Yeah, Tina, I really enjoyed it too. So um, I really do. Uh, suggest people check it out if you can. But just so you know, our, our next guest who we're bringing in right now, we're almost on air, um, is Aaron with Compass, who's going to talk to us about real estate and the housing market right now in the Bay Area. So obviously a timely and important topic. So stick with us for that. Stand by. Right, welcome back. ABC7 is committed to building a better Bay Area, and we're committed to addressing housing in the middle of this pandemic. So joining me to talk about this is someone who's seeing it firsthand, a lead agent in San Francisco for Compass Real Estate, Aaron Thompson. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. All right, so the big question, is this a good time for people to buy a house in San Francisco? Well, this is a question I get a lot, <laughs> especially in the midst of a pandemic. It can be a little confusing. I'll tell you, you know, th this crisis has created a lot of movement and a lot of need. So I think a good time to buy is when you have a need. And I would say there's quite a lot of people looking for more space to have offices, to have some outdoor space, especially in these summer months when we are faced with lots of fog. What about rent? I mean, is that something people, I think a lot of people are saying, oh, everyone's escaping the city, rent must be going down. Is that what we're seeing? There's definitely been a pretty considerable impact to the rental market. Um, a good portion of our entry-level workers and service workers are sadly without work. So these people without that income find it very difficult to pay the absorbent rent that we have here in San Francisco. So I believe the rental market has taken about a 15 to 20 percent hit. Hmm. Uh, so there's absolutely, absolutely been a pretty considerable hit to that market. So if you're looking for a small one-bedroom apartment right now in San Francisco, it might be the time to snatch it up. Um, well, and frankly, <laughs> there's a lot of people that are leaving their apartments that are too expensive because they know they can find cheaper ones. 
Right, and if you can work remotely now in Google, you know, you can do it till next summer, why yeah. would you not? Right. Uh, I want to, uh, I'm not sure if you can see this, but I'm going to show our viewers this graph uh, that our data journalism team put together uh, showing 30% of Californians are struggling to pay their rent or mortgage. 20% of Americans are, but only 19% of the Bay Area is. Does this sort of mirror what you're seeing? It does, Liz. You know, when, when we think about our primary industries, we're very tech heavy, biotech, financial services, all of those industries, for the most part, you can have your computer and work everywhere. Obviously, if you need to be in a lab or something like that, that's different. But just because of the industry focus here in the Bay Area, we are so fortunate to be able to take our jobs pretty much anywhere. Um, kind of big picture, what are the biggest changes that you've really seen since the pandemic started? That's the question we're getting in. Uh, as far as real estate? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think some of the biggest changes have to do with psychology. Um, you know, there's, there's this idea that we're in the middle of this pandemic and that everything's going to be a fire sale. That is just not the case. With crisis comes movement, and that means that people, maybe there's three roommates living in an apartment that all of a sudden are working from home. It's impossible to have three Zoom calls at one time mm -hmm. in a small apartment. So those people may be able to afford to buy and are doing so. There's also, of course, people that are downsizing so they can get their second home outside of the city. So um, there's, there's quite a bit of movement. I have to say there's also quite a bit of movement coming into San Francisco. Hmm. It's not the exodus that everybody keeps talking about. We've got people coming from the East Coast. We've, there's, there's, Interesting. San Francisco is still a very desirable place to live. Is that because people are trying to get out of the cold into some place with more outdoor space and activities? I think it's about space, mm -hmm. right? I mean, especially in summer when it's notoriously foggy in San Francisco, when everybody's kind of locked inside, all they want to do is be outside, but they can't because it's freezing cold. So to be able to get to the sunshine and then feel a little more safe, given it's not quite as congested. Yeah, I mean, I've been seeing, um, I, I live out in Marin and, and friends who are realtors there are saying just like it is being flooded with people trying to get, you know, homes out there too. So it's wild. It is a wild time out there in uh, the real estate market. Um, Aaron uh, Thompson, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your insight today. Of course. Thank you, Liz. Thank Take you. Care. Be safe. You too. Bye. All right, we're going to take a break on air, but the conversation, of course, continues on our live streams, including abc7news.com. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Oh, is Aaron's? Oh, Aaron, you're still there. Great. Hi. Okay, great. Um, so oh. actually, let's go back to talking about uh, kind of some of the suburban areas around here. It just seems like people sure. from the city are desperately trying to get to like San Rafael or some of these suburban areas with a little with a house, more space. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I we can't blame them, right? <laughs> I mean, just to get a little bit more space and and, you know, imagine how many people in San Francisco are in apartments with no outdoor right. and what that must be like. I mean, my heart goes out to all those people that are having to shelter by themselves without the outdoor. So naturally, people are looking for space. And um, I think also there's a sense of safety being outside of the city and, and less temptation to break the, uh, the uh, how do I say it, the 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 rule, right? Because mm -hmm. it's so hard when you've got so many people all over, all around you and somebody wants to go on a walk or they want to have a barbecue or have a glass of wine. I think when you're out of the city, there's less temptation. Absolutely. But I mean, it almost seems impossible at this point to find a house. I was talking to a friend who's a realtor saying that like, you know, they were, they put way over asking and they were still like the 10th bidder in line. You know, it's really, it's really remarkable. It's really remarkable. I mean, there's properties that have not been selling in Marin that are now selling for over ask. And it's, you know, lots of people going north, lots of people going east. Uh, it's, it's, it, but I have to say, it's not that different from what normally we would see as far as an exodus. It's kind of a natural thing. For there's, sure. There's a lot of movement in the city as well. For sure. Erin, I got to say bye. We're about to come back on air. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.
story earlier on Midday Live, ABC7 uh, morning anchor Kamasi Aaron and Reggie Aki talked with Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff about a number of issues, including defunding Oakland's police department. Uh, fascinating conversation. Take a listen. We've spoken to you about how you feel about further defunding OPD. How do you feel about this? Well, let's be clear. They passed a measure to establish a task force that will analyze what a 50% cut would look like, a cut of $150 million. They have not committed to making that cut, and that is the responsible thing to do. They are inviting you, the community, to come co-create what this reimagined public safety is going to look like. And before we do any more cuts to the police department, it's important that the public understands what they're losing and what they potentially are getting in its place. And that should be transparent, it should be informed, and it should be co-created with community. And that task force is gonna do just that. I'm very excited the council passed that unanimously last night. But also to be clear, this has been something that we've talked about you, talked about this with you for, for a number of weeks. This is generally not the direction that you believe the Oakland Police Department should be going in, correct? What I believe is that we need to make informed decisions. Uh, I supported the more than $14 million immediate cut to the police department's budget, but we could not see how any further cuts would not require the elimination of a service or a division. And for the council members who were asking for additional cuts, we asked them to choose and they refused to. And that's what I think is important. People need to be informed about the impacts of these choices. And based on what that study shows, I actually might be absolutely convinced that this redirection of $150 million would advance safety for my city. I want to see the data. I want the community involved in, in analyzing it and seeing it and informing those decisions. So I look forward to seeing the results of this task force. I just think this is the way to do it with information, with transparency, and with the public. Mm -hmm. Well, City Council also passed a measure to deny federal agents from being sent to the city. You've spoken out strongly about how you feel about that. But then we saw the damage to the Alameda uh, County Courthouse. And we're just wondering now, do you still feel like this is the right decision? And how, you know, can you enforce it? How can we measure if it's enforceable? Oh, I feel that it is the right decision more than ever. In fact, I joined with mayors across the country this morning from Portland and Seattle and Philadelphia and Albuquerque uh, under the umbrella of the U.S. Conference of Mayors to make a very clear and united statement that the federal government should not send law enforcement agents to perform tasks or in a way that is not approved by the local government. We know our communities. And let me be clear, I have no tolerance for vandalism. It upsets me greatly. It infuriates me. And as I said earlier this week, I believe it, believe it plays right into the hands of the Trump campaign. But I know this community. And in this community, sending federal troops in will only cause more civil unrest, more vandalism. Uh, that is very clear for anybody who knows Oakland. And I believe that President Trump knows that. And he is actually trying to do harm to our city, not make it safer, actually make it more dangerous. I want to talk to you about what's going on at Lake Merritt. This has been something that has been kind of building over the past several weeks. We've seen larger crowds, and we've also seen a real spike in coronavirus cases in Alameda County, Oakland in particular. Where are we with Lake Merritt, and are you satisfied with the way that people and police are responding? Um, I'm not satisfied because we are having unacceptable increases in coronavirus infections. And recent data from our incredible Roots Community Health Center, uh, what a trusted community organization. They are seeing a huge increase in infections caused by social gathering. This can even be with your family, but your friends. And where do we see it right out in public is around Lake Merritt. 
Now this last weekend, we really cracked down on vendors. We tried to put in a lot more traffic and parking restrictions, and we did see an impact, but I am not satisfied. People, your picnic can wait. <laughs> we have got to stay apart. Uh, all the evidence is coming out about just how important wearing a mask, just a simple cloth covering on your face is to keeping you healthy, your loved ones healthy. Um, you know, the picnic can wait. If you really love your family and friends, respect social distancing, wear a mask, and, and call them on the phone or Zoom with them because we have got to stop the spread of this virus. We are on the state's watch list. This is unacceptable. We've got to do better. Now, as far as enforcement goes, uh, we are cracking down on the vendors, uh, the parking things. Uh, I, I know that people are suffering right now financially. They're stressed out. Um, I am going to be starting to focus a little bit more on workplace uh, compliance with health orders. I want uh, our employers to make sure that workers are safe because we also have seen a lot of infections come through the workplace. So get prepared. Uh, this is something that I think will be our next area of focus when it comes to enforcement. And before we go, and can I, I just ask follow up on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Come no, on. No, Frank, you're fine. I was just going to follow up on that. So when you say workplace, are there specific, um, I'm not talking about names of companies, but specific types of businesses that you're most concerned about? Well, we are seeing some trends, particularly um, workplaces that involve a lot of low wage workers who might not have access to good insurance or health care. And so that's uh, we are going to be analyzing what are certain classes of occupations where we're seeing high cases and high infections. We know we have seen some in construction and in food service. Um, but we will continue to look at the data and make sure that our enforcement efforts are targeted. And to start with, you know, not just slapping people with fines and tickets, but providing them with resources, with information, with warnings. Uh, again, we know everyone is stressed out from this pandemic, but we have got to all do our part to keep everybody healthy. Yes, we do. Yes, indeed. Well, we appreciate you as always, coming to spend time with us and checking in. So thank you, Mayor Schaff. All right, that was Mayor Libby Schaff uh, earlier on Midday Live with Reggie and Kamasi. And we're going to take a quick break on air. We'll be back in just a moment.
All right, thank you all so much for joining us on this interactive show, Getting Answers. We talked with Stockton's mayor about the Mayor's Guaranteed Income Program, along with a documentary about uh, his life, now streaming on HBO Max. It's called Stockton On My Mind. Hopefully you got answers from Aaron Thompson, a real estate agent for Compass. We talked about the Bay Area real estate and renting market. Fascinating conversation. We'll be here every day at 3 on air and live streaming, answering your questions. World News Tonight is next. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone, on Facebook. Appreciate it. Have a good one.